Welcome back, everyone, to Entrepreneuring. I'm Garrett Weinzerl, and my guest today is a tech journalist, a podcaster, and a close friend of mine, Tom Merritt. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Garrett. Good to be here. I'm glad. I'm glad you could make it. I've been wanting to. Uh, it's it's funny because now I've we we've, we've met each other in person so many darn times and actually got to sit down and talk and hang out. But I've I've always wanted to sit down and interview you, so I finally get the chance. All right, good. I'm glad. <laughs> Thanks for inviting me. <laughs> Thanks for coming on. So. Uh, at this point, you are you're, you're definitely an entrepreneur. You, you're running your own business, basically. You've found a way to monetize podcasting, I think, quite successfully. But before all that, how did you get to that point? Because I can look you up on Wikipedia, but I, could, I would much rather hear it from you. Right, and citations are needed for most of that stuff. Exactly. <laughs> yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, yeah, I, I still don't subscribe describe myself as an entrepreneur, although I, I have been told by many others that I definitely fit that description because I am somebody who has focused entirely on content creation. It has not been my dream to start a business. I, I've started a business because that's what needed to be done to make the content that I wanted. Uh, but, you know, I guess what I do in podcasting traces its earliest roots to my first job when I was 16 years old in 1986 was for a radio station called WGEL, the best country in the country that turned into a metal station after eight o'clock every night. So were you a DJ for the country or for the metal? Yes, I was a DJ for the country and for the oh, metal. Oh, and the metal. So the answer is yeah. just yes. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, <laughs> I, uh, I did... Uh, I started just on the weekends uh, monitoring the the American Country Countdown, which you would put on with records, and and have to you know play the commercials in the gaps. Uh, but then eventually I got assigned an actual shift in the afternoon on the countryside, and because none of the people who did the metal stuff wanted to have to work on Saturday night, and I was a high school kid that was like, sure, I'll be on the radio and play metal. That sounds awesome. That I got the Saturday night shift. Wow. Well, that's nuts. Did you actually like country too, or was it just nice to get that additional gig? You know, I've always liked old country, uh, like like 50s, 60s classic country. Uh, in the 80s, I did not like what was popular at the time very much at all. So it was more just, you know, turning down the audio in between the songs I didn't like and making sure that the, the records were spinning and I read the weather in the news and all of that. Uh, but the metal stuff I was, I was actually into and, and, and was exploring and learning about while I played it. Well, that's very cool. I actually did not know that about you. So that's, that's, uh, that is super neat and explains a lot. I feel. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it's funny, uh, I got the job because my mom was an aerobics instructor. This is how 1986 this was. Wow. Uh, and she taught aerobics to the secretary and wife of the general manager owner of the station. And he was looking for someone to help out on the weekends. And she said, oh, my son is interested in a part-time job and he, he would love to try radio. Well, that's, that's, a, that's awesome. And also so bizarre. That that's yeah. the way it, it panned out. Jackie Sorensen's aerobics started my career. <laughs> Which doesn't help me at all, too, either, with kind of my opinion of terrestrial radio now, because it's like, if I wanted to go and get into it, I have no idea where I would start. And I still don't, because apparently it's, a, I don't know, have an aerobics instructor uh, meet, I guess. <laughs> well, and you're talking about a, a 3,000-watt station in a town of 5,300 people uh, in, in southern Illinois. It's, it's a whole lot different than trying to get a job in a, even a mid-sized market. Uh, and I did go on to do, continue to do radio in Champaign, Illinois, where I went to college, University of Illinois. There was a commercial rock station that was run entirely by students. It was not part of the university, but it was a nonprofit commercial station. So it it, when I say nonprofit, and it was run by a nonprofit, but it tried to make money to pay for itself, and it succeeded. Uh, and I got a job there. I, I worked as a DJ. I worked as the sports director. I was on the morning show for a while and eventually became the afternoon drive jock and uh, the program director for a couple of years. Can you do sports when you have such a clear bias for the St. Louis uh, Cardinals? Well, and yeah, and in Champaign, uh, it was very much split between the Cubs and the Cardinals uh, as far as loyalties. White Sox didn't quite make it that far down. Uh, but, you know, that's how I learned about objectivity and journalism, Garrett. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fair enough, because I, I, I find it hard picturing a world where Tom Merritt doesn't constantly root for his team. Yeah, I, well, it, it's actually kind of the fun relief of not covering sports these days is that I can make my opinions about that sort of thing clear <laughs> where, like, no kidding, back then I had to, you know, not say anything bad about the Cubs on air because there were lots of Cubs fans in the audience. 
<laughs> I'm glad Katie's out of the audience or uh, out of out of the room at the moment. My wife is a, a Cubs fan. In case I know, anyone and watching I like her anyway. She's a great person. <laughs> I'm, some of my best friends are Cubs fans. <laughs> so, so, so you went to college. You continued DJing. Uh, what what happened for you after college? Yeah, so I wanted to go to grad school in journalism. Uh, and I looked around at places that were warmer <laughs> than Champaign, uh, <laughs> at least the warmer than Champaign was in the winter. It gets pretty hot there in the summer. Uh, and I ended up uh, getting an internship to kind of tide me over. So I went to Washington, D.C. with something called the uh, Washington Center for Politics and Journalism run by Terry Michael. Uh, fantastic internship, still going on, still, still struggling along, trying to make things work. And the idea was to bring journalism students from all over the country into Washington, D.C., uh, have them placed as interns in various media outlets, and then do these seminars where they would meet journalists, go to lunch with journalists, and get to visit particular events. So I got to meet Hal Bruno, who was the senior political analyst at ABC at the time. He had helped break Watergate at ABC oh, wow. uh, back in the day, or at least, at least cover it for ABC. Right. Uh, obviously, he was not Woodward or Bernstein, but uh, he, had, he had been part of that uh, world. And so I got to sit down and have lunch and talk with him. Uh, I got to meet all kinds of, of excellent journalists in seminars. I interned at Morning Edition at National Public Radio, uh, and I even got to go to the White House during the first hundred days of Clinton and and see a Clinton press conference. Wow. Well, that, so that turned out to be quite the internship for you. Yeah, it was. it's a fantastic internship. It's a great program that he, that he does. And I was placed at NPR. Other people in my internship uh, class were placed at uh, some people at the Today Show, some people at CNN. Uh, and when I say some people, like each person in a different place. And then we would all meet twice a week. Some of us were also roommates. And so we'd share our different learnings with each other from the various internships we were having, plus the things that we were getting to experience. And then there were some trips for all of us to get together and do. It was, it was really fun. And I, I have fond memories of that still. Wow. And, and so, I mean, was this always the goal for you? You, you? I mean, clearly you were interested at a young age if you were, if you were, you were DJing, uh, even if it was a country station, it turns out. Yeah. Um, but it, but it was, were you, did, was that always your end goal or did you want to just get into more do you want to get in journalism not behind a camera not in front of a microphone some kind of journalism appealed to me even in high school and i think that's why i wanted to get into radio was i, I liked the idea of talking and telling stories uh and one of my favorite memories of growing up was just sitting with my grandpa my grandpa carl and talking about the news he loved to just talk about current affairs and we didn't always agree and that was okay and he was one of the people that taught me how to have a respectful conversation with someone you don't agree with uh, and i wanted to do stuff like that i wanted to talk about issues and and help people understand things uh and yet i loved music i loved sports i loved entertainment uh and so i wasn't sure exactly whether it was radio or tv after having been in the radio business in Champaign, which is a mid-sized market, and having been a program director and dealing with record reps, I started to see that this was a business where it was very much about who you know and what kind of luck you had. And I wasn't sure that that was for me, but I wanted to continue to find a way to have an outlet for this. So when I went to grad school at the University of Texas, I started my own website eventually. I st actually I was a little bit of a hipster. I was I didn't like the graphical web for several years. I only did things on Usenet, uh, but eventually <laughs> I gave in uh, and and got more than just a, a Unix shell account. Uh, and I started a website, and I I just started doing things. Uh, I started publishing stories. I started soliciting stories from other people and editing and publishing, doing parody oh, wow. comedy news, uh, and. I was doing a television show on Access Television in Austin uh, with a friend of mine named Russ Pitts. And, and so we were just trying things. And eventually my friend Cindy in San Francisco, who I had gotten to know in Austin, said, you have to come out here. There's jobs falling from trees. So she sent me a bunch of job descriptions. I did three interviews. It was the dot-com boom days. So I got 
offers for all three jobs. And the one I took was at ZDTV, which was a television network, but the job was writing content for the websites that went along with their television shows and they had an online radio station they were starting. So I was like, I can do all of the things. I can get involved in radio and help them out because they need more people to help with it. I can do writing on the web and I ha I'm around television and, and I can possibly get involved in television. And I did some segments on some of the shows. That just sounds insane to me. I mean, it, it, and it sounds like it was perfect for you because you didn't really have to choose. It's like, well, these are all the things I'm interested yeah. in and it's all under one roof. Well, and that's how I got the job is subbrilliant.com so slash news was what I had done as a parody site. And when I did the interview, they said, well, we need someone who knows HTML uh, because we need people who can build web pages. We need someone who knows how to write and edit uh, and how to do it quickly. And I said, well, th this is what I've been doing on my own site with zero budget. I can do that for you. And Regina Lynn Preciado, who was the producer of the websites for the help shows at ZDTV said, yeah, no, that's exactly what we want. And then for me, it was a dream come true because of all of the other opportunities it gave. Wow, oh, that's just incredible. Yeah, if I hadn't worked at Half Price Books with Cindy Harrison, who would then <laughs> send me the job description for ZDTV at a point when I was at my wit's end about where to go with my career in 1999, I would have never ended up there, which would have never led me to CNET, which would have never led me to podcasting. Wow. Yeah, that's just I mean, what a I mean, it's, it's hilarious. I'm sure most people you talk to, you, you, you trace back a lot of lines and it's like, how did any of this connect? Yeah. But uh, I mean, and, and everybody who does something that they're proud of can always trace that weird line, right? Nothing ever oh, yeah. is, yeah, I mean, I guess I shouldn't say nothing. I'm sure it's happened a couple of times, but very rarely can you say, no, I planned from the beginning to hit that and that every step of the way, it was exactly to plan. Called it like Babe Ruth and it always worked yeah, out. Yeah, right. I want to meet that person. <laughs> I'm not sure I do. I feel like it'd be a dull conversation. <laughs> <laughs> it'd be over pretty quick, right? <laughs> but uh, so, and then, so, so from there, then, then I mean, at, at what point did it start to morph into where you are now and the, and the, I, I hesitate to use the term empire you have built, but. Well, yeah, to, just to connect the dots, uh, ZDTV became Tech TV uh, when it was sold by Ziff Davis to Paul Allen. Uh, Tech TV eventually became a fairly successful television network. Uh, the international was in the black. The web was break even, which I was very proud of because that's where I worked. Uh, and the TV show was getting there, the TV shows, the TV net part of it. Uh, but Paul Allen didn't want it anymore, so he decided to sell it, and he sold it to Comcast. Comcast bought it particularly to bolster its channel G4, uh, and I'm still burned about how that went down because G4 came in with the idea that they just wanted to uh, use the subscriptions that people had to Tech TV to bolster their own numbers, and they didn't keep a lot of very valuable parts of it. Uh, because of that, I did not take an offer to join G4 when they moved everything down to Los Angeles, and a former Tech TV employee named Candy Myers was good enough to give me a shot to try some stuff at CNET. So I was brought in as mostly the homepage editor, which is deciding what the headlines are on the homepage and what stories go on there. Uh, but I had a small team that included Molly Wood, who is uh, formerly of the New York Times and now at Marketplace, uh, and, and a couple other folks, Susie Brand and Tim Moynihan, uh, that were doing the homepage, but also special packages and and kind of the utility people. Like we were we were there to pick up interesting things that couldn't be done by the classic divisions. One of those things that was being started was video, and podcasting hit in two thousand four. And I said I want to do a podcast. Uh, James Kim, who was doing MP3 uh, player coverage at CNET, wanted to do a podcast about music. Brian Cooley, who was doing automotive coverage, wanted to do a podcast about car tech. So we all got together in a room and brainstormed. And Mark Larkin, who was the head of CNET's video at the time, said, hey, uh, you know what? You guys, Molly and Tom, have this great banter just when we're talking around the office. You guys should try doing a podcast about news, just about general tech topics. And so that started Buzz Out Loud, which became a huge hit on CNET, uh, lasted many years. Uh, eventually, I got to a point with CNET where I love doing Buzz Out Loud, but it wasn't primary enough to their business model for me to spend as much time on it as I wanted to. Right. So then I had to move that away to, uh, or I had to move myself away from that if I wanted to concentrate on podcasting. So I was given a, an opportunity by Leo Laporte to start a show at his network, uh, the Twit Network, 
That's called Tech News Today. It still exists today. It's got excellent hosts, Jason Howell and Megan Maroney. Uh, but eventually, because my wife got a job in Los Angeles, I had to move down with her. Uh, and Leo didn't want to have me hosting the show from down here. He tried it. I did it for a year. Uh, but then he let go of me. And so I decided, to finally getting to answer your question of how did I get where I am today, I decided to start my own shows. And I started a bunch of them. And they have somehow done okay. Yeah, it, it, I re I remember all of that uh, very vividly uh, because it was a, <laughs> it was a point in my life where I was uh, really getting sick of change, and that was for me like, oh, come on, Tom's leaving <laughs> Daily Tech News Show. This is the last straw. Uh, you know, a couple years earlier, I had to deal with Randy leaving the Instance, one of my favorite podcasts. Oh yeah, no, I remember that too. Randy leaving the Instance, yeah. I was like, I don't know if I'm going to like the Instance anymore. And That's thankfully, I absolutely yeah. adored the Instance. That and that, still do. that particularly to give people know in my life because we're totally interviewing me. Uh, <laughs> Well, that happened right when I gave up on LA and moved back to my home state of Florida. I got back to Florida and like three weeks later, it was announced that Randy was leaving the instance. I was like, no, this is the only thing keeping me together. <laughs> and, and it's it's always hard uh, when you you come to love podcasts particularly, and I think a lot of talk radio and similar things for the same reason, because you enjoy the personality, you enjoy the camaraderie. And when you've got two people hosting a show like that, and I think this is true for these morning talk shows, I think that's why Michael Strahan and, and Kelly having problems is such huge news, is people really like the chemistry. And when you change that, uh, like when when Regis first left, or, or even before, when, when Kelly first joined Regis, everyone's like, ooh, I don't know if the chemistry is going to be the same. And so you have to get to know new people. Yeah. And that can, and that can be tough, especially if your life is in flux at the, yeah. Yeah, at that I moment. I mean, for, and for us in, in the, the Warcraft family and people who like podcasts, Randy leaving the instance was tantamount to Regis. <laughs> it was. Regis it really, and Kelly. It, it really, really was. was. Absolutely was. Cause that, that, I mean, that shit for me was with me all throughout college and, and that was what got me into podcasting in the first place. It's funny you mentioned G4 because if honestly, if I were to trace that line, that's probably where I originally got on, uh, because it was the first, I was obviously always into gaming and I stumbled across G4 one day when we moved out into the boonies and got uh, a satellite dish. Which uh, ended up yeah, having yeah, because that's we were on Tech TV was on channel 354. So G4, when it merged with Tech TV, hit that same channel on DirecTV. Exactly. So once once we had the satellite dish, all of these channels I'd never seen before, we were just surfing through one day and like, wait, video games, video games on TV, what's going on? And uh, it was the first time in my life I'd ever seen any any coverage of games like that. Never once in my life had thought about critiquing a game or uh, seeing a review of a game. Um, and that, it's funny. I haven't really thought about that in a long time. And it's, and it's, and it's kind of crazy to think that there was a point where you could have ended up on that station. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, and, and honestly, uh, G4 tech TV merged and continued to be a channel called G4 tech TV in Canada, which CNET provided a show for, for a while that I hosted. So <laughs> I did end up there just oh, wow. different place. Yeah. Just in a different region. Um, but yeah, so, so let's talk about, cause, cause you, uh, leaving, uh, tw the Twit network, leaving daily or not daily Twit, <laughs> tech news today, tech news today. Yeah. <laughs> um, that, that happened with the advent of, of a, of a new crowdfunding platform, Patreon, almost at the exact same time. It felt like for me, cause I, I hadn't heard about it until I, I heard you talking about it after you started to develop, uh, your, your first big, uh, show after leaving which was is which and still is the daily tech news show yeah patreon was something that i think launched in the summer of, of 2012 and let's see 20, 20, 2013 rather and i had created an account uh because i wanted to try it out i liked the idea which was targeted towards musicians but i'm like this could work for podcasts where you say to your audience look uh support the show directly G give us money uh, and, and, and any amount that you want, uh, and we will continue to do the show. Now, for musicians, it made perfect sense. Like, do you want me to make a song? Tell me how much money you'll pay for the song, and then I'll make the song. And every song I make, you pay this much. But because there was that recurring element, it fit very nicely into podcasts that were ongoing, where something like Kickstarter or Indiegogo didn't. Exactly. We, we, a lot of podcasters were trying. You've, you've had it before. As a matter of fact, again, once again, uh, Tom, uh, being such an influence on me, you, I think, believe your podcasts were some of the first I ever saw where they attempted, where you attempted to use Kickstarter for a podcast by doing seasons or something. Because the whole big, the big thing with Kickstarter is you need to have a start and an end and a product when it's all over. 
Yeah, exactly. And so for a couple of seasonal shows that we did, Autopilot and FSL Tonight, that were only 12, 13 episodes long, we could do Kickstarter, but you couldn't do it for a daily tech news show because it had it's, to be daily. Forever. It's indefinite. It yeah. It's, yeah. I mean, you could you could really try and shoehorn it if you tried. And it's like, you're paying for January through February. Yeah, of- but even even so, I think Kickstarter had issues uh, with, with that kind of gaming the system. And you could probably get away with it on Indiegogo because they're looser about those sorts of things. Right. But I didn't have anything to use it for. So I kind of, I started this account and then just let it sit moribund until December when I found out that I wouldn't be working for Twit anymore. And Brian Brushwood uh, and I decided that we were going to start our own independent show based on a show we had been doing at Twit that they wanted to cancel uh, about cord cutting. And he suggested, why don't we use this new thing, Patreon? And I had forgotten all about it. I, I, I was like, oh, right. I remember that came out a while back. He's like, yeah, man, this is going to be great. We'll get people to support us directly. And it was huge people really wanted to help us go independent. And I took a page from Adam Curry's uh, handbook. Adam Curry, long before Patreon, had been supporting his show directly with just PayPal donations and checks being mailed to him. And he phrased it as value for value. Like you get value from the show that I do. If you wanna give some value back for that, uh, here's how you support us. So we applied that with Patreon. It did so well with Cord Killers that two weeks into Daily Tech News Show's launch, when I was still waiting to see what I was going to do with it, what kind of show it was going to be, whether I was going to take advertising or not, I decided to launch it on Patreon. And I set a level just based on math saying, if I get this much money from the audience, I won't have to take ads because I'll be getting enough money from the audience that it wouldn't matter whether I took ads, which had the unexpected effect of a lot of people saying, do both. But of course, there were just as many people saying, don't do both or I won't need to support you. Uh, But I got to that number. I didn't ever take an ad on Daily Tech News Show, and I still don't, and it's supported directly by the audience itself. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the dawn, <laughs> the advent of Patreon, I think, just uh, completely changed the game for podcasting. Um, I, and, I, and you can do it with advertising. I, I have other shows that use Patreon with advertising, but it still gives you that direct connection. Right, absolutely. And, it's, and, and you don't feel like, at least I don't, because we use it on our shows as well. Um, heck, we have one on a show together. Um, I, I don't feel like we like, like I need to really go out and just scrape the bottom of the barrel finding whatever sponsor I can anymore because that's simply how it felt earlier when I had no other options like well I yeah, need yeah. a sponsor where this show's not even paying for itself let alone paying me um, yeah and I I went round and round on a show I do about science fiction and fantasy books with Veronica Belmont about whether we should do Patreon. Uh, and I said, look, you know, we, we don't have to make the same no ad promise, but I bet you we can make more per episode if we launch a Patreon because people will want to support us. And, and the way I explain it sometimes is with an ad model, you have to spend money with someone else in order for money to get to the thing you want to support. And that entity that's doing the advertisement obviously wants to keep a cut. So less of the money you're spending goes to the thing that you're trying to support. Whereas with Patreon, Kickstarter, Indiegogo, your money is going 100% to support the thing. And that's, I'm not trying to say advertising is bad because advertising has its place and it can help you discover things. And there's, oh, there's absolutely, good things absolutely. about that. But, but it, is, it is going to be your support being diverted through somebody else who then has influence on that final product. Right. Absolutely. Uh, I, I mean, like I said, it was just uh, it was just kind of insane. I feel like I was I started podcasting. I've, I've been podcasting just long enough to appreciate Patreon coming along. Yeah. Uh, good timing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it's uh, it, I mean, it really is incredible the way I explain it, because uh, the more and more uh, family outings I attend, the more times I get asked, how do you how does this work? I kind of like, well, it's kind of like NPR or it's kind of like PBS. It's not yeah. horrendously dissimilar. Obviously, their audiences are significantly larger. but And I think what the Patreon website does uh, that is harder, it's not impossible, but it's harder to do on your own, is creates a place for you to interact with the people supporting you most directly. Yes. Uh, you, you've got a, a location that you all know where to meet if you need to say something about the show that, you know, hey, I'm supporting the show and I'd like it to give me this or that or I have this complaint or criticism, uh, it, it's an easy way for everyone to get connected. And of course, Patreon is going to take a cut, but certainly less than an advertiser would take. And to me, it's worth it to have that meeting place. Right. Absolutely. I mean, Patreon at its core doesn't work without a community. And the right. fact that it has all these built in community tools 
And on top of all of that is the fact that anyone who is using that is one of your most dedicated community members. You now you just have a, a direct line. You have the, the red phone in your office to your the, the most hardcore of your of your your community. And I still uh, I have PayPal donation uh, just like no agenda does with Adam Curry. Uh, and, and I make that available because there are some people like, ah, I'm not really comfortable giving my information to a third party. I'd rather just give the money even more directly to you. Nobody else takes a cut. But it's it's not nearly as many people take advantage of that as want to take advantage of of this community aspect that's involved in the other thing. Yeah, I, I think I think how public it is also is, is a driving yeah. force. People can see exactly you know, how much money is going to the show. And it's gotten, it's become even better with Patreon. It used to be that they didn't, they didn't uh, show publicly an estimate of how much was getting taken out from credit card fees, for example. But right, they, they've right. changed that recently. I think the only problem with Patreon is I, they need more competitors. There, there was only one competitor called Subbable uh, that it was created by the Green guys, uh, Hank and Josh Green from YouTube fame, and Patreon bought them. And so now, not that they aren't doing a fantastic job, but there's no one pushing Patreon. Uh, I would I would like to see more people get into the marketplace. I would I would as well. I mean, more more uh, competition is always a good thing. I've uh, I've been feeling the same way about streaming. I know YouTube has a streaming thing, but it feels like Twitch TV uh, really just dominates the marketplace to a point for, where for game streaming, absolutely, yes, uh, yeah. abs absolutely. And 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 they're then they're branching out now. Though they have Twitch Creative, so you're yep. incentivized to get out there and do uh, things other than gaming on Twitch and TV. Cooking, yeah, cooking. Ashley Paramore, who hopefully I will get on here at some point. <laughs> but um, I mean, it's just it's just been a uh, just been incredible. So. Um, yeah, and, and, and it's for the community bend, something I, uh, clearly it's, it's something that you've, you've utilized a lot and it's something you're very tuned into because one of the things I remember finding really interesting after you left, uh, Twit was when you were developing DTNS, you were, you were holding these, I don't, I don't know what else to call it other than like a town hall. Like you would, you'd go up under Google hangout and everyone would come in and you would talk to your audience about what they would like your future show to be. Yeah, and, and I felt that was important, especially when I'm asking people like, hey, even just a dollar a month, uh, you're giving me your money, so you should have a say. Not not any one of you gets to dictate it, and I'm certainly going to create the show that I think is best, but there are always things, This is and this is an interesting point, because a lot of people say, well, you don't, that's just democracy, and you end up with a compromised product if you only listen to the crowd, and that's an absolutely fair criticism, but that's not how I do it. What I do is I say, well, these, these are certain things that I'm not going to change. I don't care how many of you don't like it because I know this is the right way to do it. But there are always those things where I think it could be good one way or another. And taking a cue from the audience on those very much helps to streamline things and make decisions where there isn't that clear answer. And the key is to know the difference, to say, like, these are the things that I know are right. These are the things that could go either way. Uh, and being confident enough to be able to let that decision go out there. For instance, we uh, we asked people, what kind of segments do you like on the show? And we were doing several different kinds. One of them was a calendar that I always liked. I liked the idea of telling people, here are the events that are coming up. And there were a few people in the audience that wrote in with to contribute events. And some people said they liked it. We did a survey. Pe universally, like 70% of the people said, get rid of the calendar. It's useless to me. And that was something where I'm like, you know what? I don't think it's essential. If they had said, get rid of the headlines, I would have said, no, obviously we're doing the headlines. But <laughs> it was something where I was on the fence about it anyway, because I wasn't sure how impactful it was. And so talking to the audience helped me clarify that decision. Well, and then that's good information to have because effort goes into that. And so now the time is yeah. freed up to put more effort into the parts of the show that are working. Yeah, and, and there's an, a contrary example, which is a lot of people saying, I would really like to have uh, a, a, a smaller version of the downloadable video. I, I, I'd like to have a, a lot more graphic elements in your video. And, and there are a significant number of people saying that, and I have declined to do that because I only have so much time. And to me, I would be undermining the main content of the program that I spend a lot of time on in order to do that at this point. Yeah, we. I, I definitely see that on my shows as well. For me, it always just comes down to well, the the audio only numbers are way higher than everywhere else. So yeah, that too. That, that's that's that comes down to, for me, and it's hard. It's it's something I personally struggle uh, as far as uh, graphics and whatnot, and just making my show shiny because I'm a trained graphic designer. So naturally, that's what I'm pulled towards. But I'm also I'm I have that wake up call that you have where I'm like hours. I only have so many hours in the day. Yeah. 
So. Would you would you rather me create really great headlines or or or, or deal with uh, putting in some special graphics every day? Like the you know there's there's 20 minutes in each case. I'd rather spend the 20 minutes on the content. Right. Right. Absolutely. So. Well, Tom, uh, thank you for your time and, and sharing your story with me. I've re- it's, it's, it's been fun. I, I'm surprised how much stuff I didn't know. <laughs> well, thanks, man. Uh, th- thanks for, for being interested. Uh, it's, it's fun to chat about this stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So where can everyone find you? Uh, TomMerritt.com. There's two R's, two T's in Merritt uh, is the place that collects everything together. There's a list of all my shows. Uh, there are blog posts for everything that I do. Uh, so that is probably the central location. If you're looking out there on Twitter, uh, you can find twitter.com slash Tom Merritt. And then that will tell you how to follow my actual Twitter account, which is Ace Detect, A-C-E-D-T-E-C-T, which is a long, long story in and of itself. <laughs> I'll have to get that on round two when we yeah, have you exactly. when you have you on again. Sure. Uh, and anyone who's interested in Patreon or crowdfunding in uh, in general, I highly recommend you go and check out any of Tom's Patreons to see how to do it correctly. But uh, one for a daily tech news show is just a runaway success, and I'm so happy for you. Um, so I would definitely well, point you. people there if you want to uh, if you want a starting point to see uh, a monolith of a Patreon. Go take a look at that. That's Patreon.com/slash/DTNS. Absolutely. Well, thank you everyone for listening. Do not forget to subscribe. And we will see you next time.